What is going on, everybody? Ryan Leary, William Tinkup here on the Use Case Podcast. Today, we have Kim Kelly with us uh, from PeopleWorks. We're going to be talking with her all about the use case for her technology, what problems they're solving and what they're doing. But before we get there, William, what is going on today? How are you? I'm looking for the Cowboys, Ryan. We got a lot of hope. We got oh, a lot of you, hope. you must be muted right no, now. No, we got a lot of hope. A lot of hope. It's very early in the season. A lot of hope yeah. for the Cowboys. Yeah. It'll all be gone by, you know, week eight. So <laughs> I'm I'm still saying I got to enjoy it. Seven. I got to enjoy it. <laughs> this season starts. Your season's over. I'm a, Kim, I'm let's a, move on. Yeah, I'm a living hope right now until it's shattered. I think that's the official logo of the Cowboys yeah, now. It is. I'm living it is. In the it hope. is. So. How about them mm-hmm. Cowboys until week eight? So, <laughs> well, Kim, you're in Dallas, but you're yeah. not born and bred in Dallas, so yeah. you're not too bad. You're yeah. half good because you're still living in Dallas. That's right. People here in Philadelphia don't appreciate that, but we'll we'll save that for another day. She's, she's How not are a you, cold, Kim? She's not a cold weather person, right? You, you know. No, she's, no, she's, no, no. no. Like, not. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hawaiian Viking Irish is. Don't do well in cold. Like Vikings, you no. would think so, but no. Where they land, landed, yeah, you know, they they told us otherwise. Uh, I'm great, Ryan and William. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I I actually did listen to a few of your other podcasts to get the rhythm, and I'm not gonna lie, I was laughing quite a bit because oh a lot of the content uh, and conversations. I get. I guess that's really what I'm more excited about is the conversations. <laughs> That you just bring out. Uh, I, I was like, okay, well, I'm I'm pretty pumped to to be on this podcast. So thanks. Well, now we know where the one download last month came from. Yeah, yeah. The words were soft. <laughs> Kid, why don't we start off? Uh, introduce yourself, the company, what you guys are doing, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm Kim Kelly. I've um, been in HR tech and ops for all of my career, just in different Whoa. capacities. And uh, I launched People Work six years ago. And what we do is really predict the future workforce. That's the end game of the, oh, cool. the product. There's a lot of cool things that happen inside of the experience for our multitude of users, but that's really our end game. I love it. Okay, so spell the name of the company real quick. It's Phonetics. P E P E L W E R K. And teachers love us because we're teaching everyone about the accent E uh, right. instead yeah. of pe- Pepplewick. Um, I've been told that I look like Chinese spam sometimes. So, yeah, I get it. I, get it. I do love the logo, though. I'm not going to lie. That's one of the first things that stuck out on the site. So, that's really we're, wonderful. we're good there. So, when you say future of work, are you talking uh, mostly about skills? I'm talking about attributes and okay. skills. Okay. And it's, that's tell really us the difference between those two. Yeah, attributes are William, your attributes are that <laughs> you are probably a processor, you're naturally curious, mm-hmm. you're going to be very good for things like problem solving through discovery, you are naturally social and inquisitive. Those are William's attributes. Yeah. Ryan, I'm not quite figured right out. Right here. Oh, no, I can't wait till she does you. I'm feeling judged now. She can't figure me out. Well, can tell so you. that's part of my AI in my platform is I take a picture of people's face and I basically simplify some of that self-discovery uh, through the use of things that are called genoscience and genotyping, as well as psychometric evaluations. But I kind of wrap it up into this pretty little picture. Can you take a picture of yourself? So let's talk about the platform a bit. What's the problem that you are attempting to solve here? Well, uh, to be frank, uh, the problem that I set out to solve is so that I never had to do the same thing as an HR executive ever again in my life. Um, And then selfishly that I could save my grandchildren from having the same mistakes and misunderstandings about their place in the world as I passed down to my uh, children because I kind of kept my head in the sand as they were approaching adulthood and I I just kind of didn't realize it. So for selfish purposes completely is uh, 
what problems I'm after solving. But if I'm putting it in a, a more like professional conversation, most HR leaders, not HR administrators, HR leaders are looking for better ways to relate to their people. And they simply can't do that with legacy systems and processes because HR went from administrative to systematic to the sidekick roles of all of the other leaders in, in the organization. Sometimes we're confused with legal, sometimes we're confused with operations. Uh, and then like, sometimes we're also confused with being cops. Like, you know, people in the workforce, they think don't go to HR because that means you're in jail. Like you're in, you're gonna go to the principal's office. So there's been this whole kind of thing around what is expected out of HR, but unfortunately, like over 30 years, we never really evolved anything in it. Like HR, if you were a, an administrator, you just kind of dealt with the hand that you were dealt. And if you were a leader like me, you were like, I am living the same problem over and over again. I can't get ahead of my workforce needs. I'm constantly chasing my tail. I'm trying to engage my employees that are doing like four jobs and really don't care about what's going on in my company. Like, what is this game that I'm failing at, but what could be what I'm doing to succeed at it? And so that's really what uh, I designed people work for. It's so that HR leaders can autonomize and leverage machine learning and AI to get ahead of human capacity planning, talent management, workforce uh, workforce planning, learning and development, and, uh, and let their employees tell them what they need so that they can become better leaders. So real quick, did you jump from being an HR leader to starting mm -hmm. people work? How is that? How is the jump? I'm, I'm always curious. I mean, we've seen it work really successfully in a lot of places, but how is the jump for you? Uh, like the jump from being an entrepreneur to an in, in industry. Uh, well, uh, this is my second business. Okay. So I've been an entrepreneur before. I do think it's a disease. It's not a, it's not, not something that anybody should be aspiring to. Aspire to. Yeah. <laughs> but um, when when I left my last role as a chief HR officer, it was a global e-commerce company. Uh, it was a it was kind of a strategic exit because the company was going through a divestiture and uh, leadership and the size of the company had changed. So it was just like, hey, it's this is probably not the right size and not the right structure for me. And I um, I was obviously in a, a spot in my life where I had time to think about what it is that I wanted to. And I know that I didn't want to implement another ERP system. I didn't want to implement an applicant tracking system. I didn't. Why not? Want to, uh, I don't know, because I got sick of drinking. My liver couldn't take it anymore. 100%. 100%. Not a masochist. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe yeah. just didn't want to go through that bit again. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so I just knew the laundry list of things I didn't, you know, didn't want to do. So mentally, I didn't think I wanted to be an entrepreneur either because it is a painful journey and especially what I knew what I was up against um, in order to, to do something like people work. It's, um, right. you know, it's up against a lot. So I did go back to drinking and that's how I made the decision. 100%. 100%. Who do you get compared to? Is there somebody in the space? Because... Uh, I always tell people that it's the status quo that's usually your biggest competitor is people just doing the same shit the same way. But do you have somebody else that's out there that it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can see some of the, some people getting us confused. We always, um, in um, conversations, people always try to just like, I guess really anybody does with anything that's unfamiliar. You try to find an association. Right. And, uh, a component of what people work is they're like, oh, okay, well, you're indeed your zip recruiter. Oh, well, these five things you're really linked in. Right. Uh, on these things, you're really more like replacing Google marketing. You know, on these things, like we get kind of bucketed, yeah. but most of the time at the conclusion of the call, they're like, well, I don't really know how to describe you. And I said, yeah. that's why we are called people work. Yeah. That's yeah. the name of this new thing. 
And and that is sometimes what takes a little bit of processing for people. Well, and also, where does it come from? What budget? As you know, because you created That's a bunch awesome. of HR budgets, right? There's yes. A, there's a row and a column at one point. So it's got to be in a row and a column. And, uh, and so I think that's sometimes that startup's biggest kind of hump that they have to overcome is understanding the HR budget and how it works, mm -hmm. both systematically how it works and how it goes, but also what, what are the line items? Where are the categories? Where do you, where are you going to pull from? And, uh, I've advised a lot of startups. So I, I get this all the time. I'm like, we're a new category. I'm like, eh, don't ever tell anyone that again. <laughs> Never say that out loud. Especially in front of me. Don't ever say that out loud. Tell them that they'll take this out of X budget. Could be culture, could be, you know, engagement or employee experience. Take it out of the things that already have that are established budgets and say, mm -hmm. hey, you're going to spend less there and here's what you're going to get. But don't try to create a new, a new line item is 18 months at least to get a new line item on an HR budget. There's a, you remind, uh, William, I love the fact that you are uh, talking about uh, where, where is the money? Like where, right. where's the purse? I mean, that's, <clears throat> I guess that was one of the things I had already because of my life experiences. My, I, I started my career at Walmart. Everything has a purse. I did too. Oh right. my gosh, Tim William, Dallas are we following each other? I worked for, I worked, I worked for Sam. We could totally talk about that separately. I got, oh my gosh. I got, I got his autographed copy of Sam's rules. Hung up in my office. Oh, oh, that's so cool. Oh, my gosh. I feel like yeah. I should leave this Autograph, conversation. Autographed copy of his book. I had a, I had an office. It was a cube. I had a cube outside of his office. Wow, Benville. William. Ryan, that's okay. You can be like the awkward third row. It's okay. Yeah. He brought, yeah, us, that, he brought me from yeah. the stores. Uh, back in the day, I opened up. It's called Hypermart. It was a joint venture between Cullum Company, Tom Thumb. And Walmart, they were called Hypermarts. There's two in Dallas, one in Garland, one in Arlington, two in Kansas, one in Kansas City, and uh, one I can't remember the other city's name. And I opened up all four of them and wow. then went to Walmart, Division One, went to Walmart and loved it. I mean, I. Wow. Well, I, then that's Walmart. why you know to ask for the budget question because that's. 100%. I mean, you just know where it's at. And um, when, when I started, people were. In the startup scene, it was very awkward for me because I'm not I'm not the average startup CEO. Right. And even when <clears throat> there's I don't even know what the number is. Like I'm I don't know what the percentage of executives convert to entrepreneurship and struggle with that startup scene because most of the startup scene is there to teach like fundamentals of business, right? Right. <laughs> and a lot of the times when when a new salesperson would come into people work and they would say, Oh, you know, I was so excited. I, I, um, I got, they were so intrigued about people work and they want to do this. And I said, did you, where's the money coming from? And they said, well, you know, we'll have that on the next conversation. I'm saying you're not going to make a sale because the la la hope, especially in HR software world is, is there's nobody that says no. That's well, it's because the they don't know what the heck to do with you. Somebody's going to say yes or no very clearly you're, you're about what it is that this. you're doing. Yeah. yeah. But if you say, this is where I want you to start, and this is how much money I need to do that, and then you say yes, now we're, you know, we're really talking about a transaction here, which is good. Who are we selling to here? Kim, what's the, what's the target? What companies are we going after? What size of company? Ryan, I appreciate that question, and I don't at the same time. Because okay. our, our, our bread and butter, what people work is where, where we provide the most value is the small and medium sized organization. And for us, right. that means you've reached 5 million and you are growing at a certain rate, mm -hmm. or you are tipping the 100 million scale and you don't know necessarily where to right size to protect margin and do what you need to do to get over what's called the, 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 the big hoop, which is to be considered an enterprise organization. We do have a few outlier enterprise organizations, but they are by brand early adopters. They right. uh, came to us for a very specific use case. They came to us also because they were hard, they were 
1,000 commit, 1,000 percent committed to um, doing more than lip service right. to doing business mm -hmm. with women minority-owned tech companies to help change the That's leadership cool. yeah. space right. of who owns HR tech. And those big enterprise companies, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the risk that they took on me early on, like early on in the, the whole uh, uh, phase of people work, which was in 2019, hung on with me through 2020 as we no one knew what to do. And then came through with flying colors, you know, six years later, I'm, I'm really grateful for those enterprise companies, but they're not my, they're not the, the target audience. What do you ask to be integrated with, like technology-wise, and the stack that they have? What's your are they? Uh, what do they need you to be integrated with? On an enterprise level, it always comes down to their ERP system, yeah. and we do replace and or integrate into a recruiting module of an ERP system, but we don't like to. So on an enterprise level of an ERP system. Because the value proposition to employees is different than an ERP system. And so we, right. we, we try on purpose to say, can you treat us like we're an employee program? Don't treat us like we are part of talent acquisition cycle. They will benefit from the byproduct. But we don't want to be in the resume world. We don't want to try. We don't want you to try to take something new that breaks bad behavior and then stick us into that bad behavior. <laughs> so we really, we really, we really try not to do that on the small and medium sized business um, organizations, man, it is wild west of tech yeah. stack. I mean, we have some cousins platform that was created in, Romania, I don't oh, yeah. even know oh, what yeah. it is that it does. Like, I, I mean, we've got the gamut. I, mean, I don't even know if I could tell you, besides HubSpot. Now, HubSpot is our preferred CRM partner um, oh, cool. for a lot of reasons. So we do a lot of integration uh, with HubSpot. But outside of, like, HR onboarding, payroll systems, uh, work management platforms, my goodness, mm. all over the place. I've said that there's no two HR tech stacks alike in the world. I agree. I don't think they exist. Like if you go into a company, there's just they're they're stacked differently. They started with Career Builder, then they then they got this ATS. Well, now they're on their 18th ATS. Okay, <laughs> like you know, none of them have the exact same bit. It's... But I'm so curious, William and Ryan. Mm -hmm. If all of them are different, why are they all trying to do the same thing? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's a question we ponder quite often. Oh, 100 percent. I think I think a lot of what drives that is is FOMO, is that they think that someone else has it figured out. Nike surely has it figured out. So let's do what Nike does. Zappos. Oh, my God. Zappos. Mm -hmm. They've got it figured out. Let's do what they do. And that doesn't work. You've got to do what's what's right size to your company, the business outcomes, your employees, your candidates, et cetera. And so yeah, I think the right size of your it... technology needs to be – it should be individual. I mean individualistic in the sense of a fin f fingerprint, but I think why, why people want to do it in, in other ways is driven because they think that someone else is doing it better and they're not. I th I think there's also an element of how the organization is structured and I'll, I'll use recruiting softwares, you know, things like that. Recruiters are curious and we've talked about this. Recruiters are curious by nature is what drives them. And they're constantly being sold to oh, yeah. for the little knickknack type recruiting tools. Yeah. And they'll bring in 30 different tools to their team. And at some point the, the company or they, their, their managers give into it. And now they have 20 different things that they're using or that they're paying for that they're not using or not using <laughs> appropriately. Mm -hmm. And they're just sitting there, right? So they may have four different sourcing tools or five different communications tools and they're not using them or they're not using them appropriately and nothing ties into each other. I think we're seeing less and less of that now, but only at organizations that have some sort of complexity to them. 
and managers or leaders, I should say, not even managers, leaders that care about the budget and the organization. The the caring part. Now that caring. is that is a that is like an emphasis for the conversation. Mm. Because one of the things that I I um I have no patience. Mm. And I don't like to do things over and over again and get horrible results. I like Einstein's theory of crazy. Like if you expected the same thing and did something different, right. like ew. So that was another contention I had in the the realm of HR. Like HR executives, they get up on a platform and they are like, I want diversity and equity and I want all of these things and I believe in AI. And then you go <laughs> look under the hood. They did not change their ERP systems. Uh -oh. They didn't change their employees. They didn't change their um, operating processes. Uh -huh. But somehow, magically, there's this theory of equality and equity opportunity for jobs. And I'm like, bullshit. No, I did no. that. I know that that's not right. So you can put widgets and plugins and try to video record somebody and then still impose your bias because you like to have that control right. and then foul the whole system up again. I'm like, no, 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 no. So the caring part to it is kind of where my brain is stuck right now yeah. because there are governments around the world that do not allow functions. Yeah. It is a centralized government responsibility because why? The government wants to track the taxes. We are the sure. only country that is like, hey, between taxes, your income, and you getting a job, we want like 30 people to be involved in this stack. <laughs> so for us to have conversations, like when we have conversations with our prospects, I start off with, what do you like to do in your job? Do you really enjoy getting to know the people? And do you really care about the financial integrity of your company? And do you really care about the humanity of what job? And I know that sounds like EBDV stuff, but Mike, do you really care about the humanity of what HR's contribution is to the world? Or do you just love your Excel worksheets and administrative processes and the, the superficial control? And you might be thinking to yourself, no, she doesn't really say that in a sales call, but I do. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Because well, it helps the quickest me. path to it's the quickest path to a good call. Yes, yes. I mean, like I don't want do. you. I know. I know what my platform can do for a true HR leader who sees the immense value of simplifying their life and optimizing the human experience through work, versus. You're an administrator and you told me, oh, I have to really start from the foundation. I'm sorry. It is 2024 and you're about to put in your first ATS system. Yeah. <laughs> you're not a tech innovator. Let's let that no. go. It, ship yeah. sailed. Ship sailed. Well, I uh, despise software categories. However, again, like the HR budget, there's rows and columns and stuff like that. What category do people put you in more often than not? Yeah, more often than not, we get put under talent management. Okay. And under talent management, I'm either put in as a marketing expense. Interesting. Okay. Or I am put in under data analytics and reporting. Okay. 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 What would you like for that to be? If there was a category that you would like to be in, what would it be? The category is fucking fabulous. It's my category. Mm -hmm. I own I love it. it. There's no That's other it. categories. That's no, re realistically, realistically, because like a CFO, if I started a conversation with a CFO right. of a, a smaller organization that's growing, and this CFO is like, I really like automation. I, I see the financial growth of my company. I don't want to be belabored by traditional HR functions. We have an HR manager. This is not a tool to replace the HR function as a human tool for the organization. 
it is meant to replace the unnecessary repetitive bottleneck that can be HR administrative administration. So we, when a CFO brings us in, they're like, well, you replace 17 systems that we had as a proposed budget. So I can just put you, we have our ERP, we have our work management system and we have people work. That's it. And I love when we get those opportunities because we're right at the cusp of these really great companies that are going to be, you know, my kids Google of the world. Right. And we're getting we're getting them started from such a fabulous foundation to help them redefine and connect with human beings for work in, in, a, in a, it. And it just wasn't possible when I started my career. So CFOs, that's where they kind of end up. If I'm in the house that's already got all those line items, that's usually where I'm stuck. And I don't really debate where I'm stuck. Um, what I do prefer, though, the the final leadership, the champion on the inside to recognize us for is the predictive analytics. Like you can put me in a category of this, that, or the other, and I don't care. But what I want you to know at the end of the year, when you evaluate your budget, I cannot live without that information. And that information is what I will pay all day. Where do you find that most companies as you're talking with them, going through a demo or, or, you know, just talking with them about what you all are doing, where, where's that moment? What's the aha moment that they have? They're like, yeah, Kim, Kim's our solution here. People work is, is our solution. We need to bring them in. It really, it comes down to three questions. I say, and, and I, let me go back a little bit to answer your question about our target. Our target um, industries are skills-based high demand industries. We do very well in entertainment, very well in energy, very well in manufacturing, very well in technology, very well in agribusiness. All of these um, industries that are or have been uh, realizing, and I'm sorry, construction, the value and power of automation through their business. And they're now trying to bring that automation to their workforce in terms of um, real-time skilling, pre proactive workforce building. Like that's the thing, like what, what is it that, that's getting us? So those industries are where we have like our symphony moments, right? Um, healthcare is, is another industry that we play in, but I mean, healthcare is healthcare. We, the specialist in healthcare, like if it's a very specific business unit of the healthcare system, we do very well in, but healthcare, like as a broad category, like it kind of, you know, it's hit and miss. But I went, I wanted to go back to that, Ryan, because in order to answer your question about what it is that gets them to the aha, I say, if you were able to retain 12% of your talent acquisition, marketing, and learning and development budget per employee that you lost last year, would that be a value to you? Most, most organizations are spending uh, $33,000 per total employee acquisition, learning and development by the time somebody leaves. So then the math is immediately in our favor. The second thing I, I tell them is if I could tell you who out of your entire workforce is your next manager, your next specialist, your next champion in an hour after you start implementation, would that be a value to you? <laughs> yes, because they're trying to do succession planning. They're trying to figure out the retirees who are leaving. They're trying to figure out how to, to plug this people hole that keeps getting compounded. And then the third thing I ask them is, if you could distribute in real time the power of your employees to have mentorship and coaching conversations just at their whim at 10 o'clock at night, at four o'clock in the morning through a personalized AI career assistant, do you think that would help bring your employees more better peace of mind and, and help retention? And they always say yes. So it's those three questions that they're like, oh, well, the way you asked the question, I didn't think of your solution as that because I was trying to put you into a familiar hole. Right. And I'm saying, well, you don't do that because I'm looking at the end game for you because I was in your boss's seat. I want these answers. I want to know 
who I'm hiring in 2025 so that I can tell my sales team, sell more of this because I have the skilled people to do that. Don't sell more of that because we don't have enough robots or people to do that job. And by the way, our current workforce, we're going to be okay because we have a transition plan. That's what I wanted to be able to say as a chief HR officer or a strategist. And I never could. Like you're always like trying to chase the puzzle piece that never gave you the information because it's just you weren't set up to do that. Like you just weren't. Let me ask you a couple of buy side questions. If and when you do a demo of uh, people working for somebody, what's your favorite part of the demo? Gosh, that was a great question. When they say yes. <laughs> you know what, Ryan? That's, that is true. Gosh, you know what? I There's a couple. I love the faces. I love the, you know, I love, I love the shock of the face oh, as yeah. they go through. Because it takes like 10 minutes to do and understand what people work is. And, and obviously, demo is not necessary. Go create an account, play around, start developing your AI career assistant, do your thing. Like you're going to figure out real quick whether or not it's something that's going to work for you. Because as I have lived and breathed through 5,000 SaaS full stack program, HR, enterprise systems, I don't ever want to do that to people. So my system is real time. We do integrations within hours. You, I mean, like we, we want you not to have to execute your, your employee um, assistant programs in order to implement people work. Like we just want you to be happy that you did it and drink coffee along the way and watch the amazing results. So the shock and awe of all of those things, Ryan, during a demo call is what it is. It's like, it was, that was it. And it did all that. I, I don't believe that your system can do all that. That like that replaces so much. That just made my life so easier. And it did. And now I know that that I, that Joe was like out in the field, and he's my next manager. I never even thought he cared about his job. Like those are the reactions that I get. And I love it. So I love all those things. Ryan, did you have some? I have, I have a couple. No, no, no. Go ahead. I thought you had a follow up there. I did. Favorite uh, customer success story without naming names or any of that type of stuff, but just someone that might have even been critical or cynical about what you do. They implement it anyhow, and all of a sudden, they can't imagine life without it. <laughs> I, I'm going to do the the cynical one because that's <laughs> my fun. I, I love I love those because the doubt, like, oh yeah, sure. yeah, sure. Like, yeah, we've seen this. Yeah, 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 we yeah we've seen a version of this. No, you haven't, but that's okay. I in twenty and this was early on. So what we did, twenty eighteen, my co founder and I, Malahar, we we actually had built kind of like a, a solution to an HR problem when we worked together. So we knew that we were going to work well together. And our team that started with us in twenty eighteen, we really committed to getting as close to the full cycle version of the platform that we could before we went and provoked all of our beta customers to participate in 2019. And I on purpose picked various roles within the HR ecosystem at various stages of company and sizes. So like a, a VP of HR at a small company and a VP of an HR at a, a medium sized company and a VP of HR or CHRO at an enterprise company, they all have different scopes of problems and they see the value differently. So that was very important to me. But the one, the one talent and acquisition dude that came <laughs> so pompous, he, he thought he just knew everything about Ryan, what I, it Ryan already know who you're talking about. Thought you were talking about William in a nice way. Fair enough. I'm just gonna... Fair enough. <laughs> Fair statement. His bravado, I was like, wow, this dude is like, he believes, and he believes yeah. to his core that he knows everything that there is to know about the world of talent acquisition. And I said, okay, well, tell me what your problem is now. He's like, well, I, I don't have enough tech arts for my company, the software company. I'm like, okay, in my mind, I'm like, of course you don't have enough tech arts because people work didn't exist 10 years ago to solve this problem. But, okay, you don't have enough tech arts. I said, how much money do you spend annually recruiting tech arts? 
He said, well, and I know he didn't know the exact number, but his ego was not going to let him say, I don't know. Right. He, right. he said, I believe it's around $160,000 in marketing spend for, I said, how many tech arcs did you need? Four. Mm. Okay. You need four tech arcs and you need them to have, to be ready to do business now. There's like revenue waiting on the table for these, these uh, roles. He said, oh yeah, it's been open for like a year and a half. Okay. I said, all right. Opportunity cost. Got it. Yes. Hey, thank you, William. So I said, okay, if you don't use people work and you continue to do what you're doing, what is your bet that your year is going to end up the same way that you had it? So he said, 80%, maybe I'm going to find my magic unicorn. I said, okay. And then once you found your, your unicorn, because this is a high demand role, like how long do you think you're going to stay? You're going to play the salary game. They're going to get that letter. If you get them in India, you get them in Russia, you get them in the United States, they're all playing the same game. So how long are they going to stay there for? And then how, you know, what's your turn? I'm making him think through what he thinks he knows because I want him to see what he is going to get, right? That's what I'm making sure is happening in the conversation. It's a comprehension of value. So I said, okay, so over two years, we're about 210, 220 into the recruiting cost. You're going to have an opportunity cost that's going to continue for another eight to 11 months. Revenue's just flushing down the toilet. So you're just compounding it. Let's just throw another 100,000 on there. You're like another 310, maybe 320 onto these roles that you have and you don't know. And then at least 50% of them are going to turn. And then you're going to have to do that cycle all over again. I said, is it a fair deal? that I can say that your organization has lost two years and maybe $400,000 just on these roles. He said, that's fair, I'll take it. I said, okay, that's my starting point. I want you to go into the system and design your unicorn. Attributes, what kind of culture fit am I looking for? What kind of mind am I looking for? Skills, abilities, knowledge. Put your comp in there. All right. We're going to introduce you and we're going to call him Ryan for this conversation. This is all happening now automatically. Ryan shows up as a match. Ryan is a 80% match to this unicorn position in less than three hours. Why? No resume, blind matching, attributes. Ryan has the work ethic, the mentality, the learning capability, and the basic skills to do this role. So now we'll just call him Joe. Joe has this automated conversation already with Ryan. He's actually on vacation. He's on the beach. He's like, I don't think your system is going to work. He doesn't interrupt his wife. He has the interview with Ryan. They do a live uh, test of skills. And he calls me immediately after. And he says, holy shit. Where did you find Ryan? I said, I didn't find Ryan. I told, I marketed to Ryan saying, you're a human being and you have attributes and abilities and a way of thinking that can provide value to organizations. I don't want your resume. I don't want you. And then it wasn't chat GPT resume gaming, but it's all gaming. I don't want you to game your resume. I don't want you to oversell me on LinkedIn. I don't want you to use me as a bartering chip. And the company still has Ryan working for him today. That was all within a week. And it all cost them $1,700. Josh Mike walks off stage. Jim, this has been fantastic. I absolutely love, I know Ryan does too. We love what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Just, just, and love your nature as well. So just thanks for coming on the show.